All right, so moment of inertia is your mass parallel thing. Like it's, it's rotational mass, okay? But it's not just mass, it's about how the mass is distributed about the axis rotation. So if you want to think about how hard it is to rotate something, if you had a rod and you're rotating about the center of mass, would that be easier or harder than if you had it at the end and had to rotate it about the, the end, which would be easier to rotate or which would be harder to rotate? About the end, it would be harder to rotate. Therefore, you're going to have a higher moment of inertia. Okay. And inertia in just in linear, linear motion wants to go, wants to maintain its present state of motion. So if it's at rest, it wants to stay at rest. If it's moving, it wants to stay moving at a constant speed in a straight line path. Moment of inertia, or sometimes called rotational inertia, says it wants to maintain whatever rotational motion it's doing. So if it's at rest, it doesn't want to start rotating. If it's rotating, it wants to maintain that same rotational speed. It doesn't like to change. Good with that? That's why this is harder to rotate because it has a higher rotational inertia. It wants to maintain that present state of motion, has that tendency, has a greater tendency, okay? So that's the math for parallel axis theorem. Cr like crunch through that one real fast. Okay. So um, <clears throat> extended free body diagram. This is you are drawing the forces acting on the object where the object's being acted upon. So let's pretend you are pushing a refrigerator. Okay and it's just about to start tipping on this corner, okay? A normal free body diagram would look like this. You have your force of gravity, you have your applied force, you'd have friction, and you'd have normal force. That'd be your normal free body diagram. Okay, your extended free body diagram looks like this. Your force of gravity is still at the center of mass. That's the only one that changes. Still, we draw it from the center of mass. Okay, you are pushing right here. So we would draw the free body, the applied force at the location where the force is acting on it. Good with that? Um, normal force, because we're about to tip, I did not draw that very well. Um, because you're about to tip, that um, force, that normal force is on this edge, okay? And because it's at that point here, you have static friction at that point there. Okay. So that would be your extended, that would, what your extended free body diagram would look like. Okay. Now, um, this will capture or describe Oops. Describe the motion of the center of mass. Okay. Some textbooks don't draw the box. They just draw it like as a dot, a particle, and they'll do this.
okay? <clears throat> what they're assuming is we're going to concentrate all the mass to this one point, wherever that's looking at the center of mass. And the motion of this center of mass is described when we do, oh, okay, we're going to do the sum of the forces in the x direction. Is it equal to zero? Some of the forces in the y direction. All this stuff is looking at the motion of the center of mass. Okay. Now, when we start doing um, extended free body diagrams, what we're looking at is an additional piece, additional layer, uh, an added layer of complexity. Everything we've done so far is valid and true, but it describes only what happens to the center of mass. You can now start talking about things rotating about a point with this, okay? This is still true. This is just another layer, an additional layer, add a layer of complexity, okay? You're right with that? So we'll use this to help us understand torque and stuff like that, okay? So, um, so this describes motion, uh, rotational motion about a pivot point. And sometimes that's the center of mass, sometimes it's not, depending on how we do it. Okay? But the green is always true. I don't care what your scenario is, you can draw a normal free body diagram and come up with good conclusions based off of that. It might not be all the conclusions that you need, but still valid. Okay? So. All right, so torque is the rotational counterpart to force. Um, it's the twisting or rotating force that causes an object to experience rotational acceleration if unbalanced. Um, <clears throat> and you can calculate that by saying um, the radius, uh, the component of the radius that's perpendicular to force times the force, or you can find the component of force that is perpendicular to the radius and multiply that. Okay, so it's finding the component, the perpendicular component of one of those vectors multiplied by the whole vector. Okay, and I'll, I'll unpack that here momentarily. The unit is meter newtons, not to be confused with joules, which is a newton times a meter. In the English or standard, we use foot pounds for torque. So just so you can, like, meter newtons. You don't combine those, just meter newtons. Okay? All right. So direction of torque, again, you're using your right-hand rule. You're looking to see which way that force causes the object to rotate. Okay? If it's going to make it rotate this way, this, this is the direction of torque, which is orthogonal, perpendicular to this plane of rotation. Okay, so you're just looking at like, which way would that make it rotate? That would be the direction of torque. Okay, so here are some examples of when it would be helpful to do the component of uh, the radius that is perpendicular to the force. And yeah, so here we're going to say that's our pivot point. Okay. Typically, like with rectangles, squares, stuff like that, it's helpful to look at it this way. And here would be one of those. Here's how you do that. So what you do is you would draw for this one. You would. This is known as the line of action. Okay. Remember when we were adding vectors and we had like vector one doing this and vector 
a second vector doing this and then we could like do head to tail and we could cut and paste this one and move this here so long as it had the same magnitude and it was pointing in the same direction that was okay that's what we're adding okay when we're multiplying uh specifically this is a cross product we'll get to that later um, you are allowed to move this vector anywhere along this line of action. So you're constrained to this line. Okay. Here you had more freedom. You could just move it anywhere you wanted to. Here we can only move it along the line of action. Okay. And we're going to move it to a place where we want the tail of this to be as close to the pivot point as possible. That's what we're going for. So we're going to slide this along this uh, line of action until the tail is as close to the pivot point as possible. So this is the whole force. Okay. This. Mm, 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 mm. That would be your radius vector. Anytime you have a little arrow above that, that just means it's a vector quantity. It's a vector measurement. It's just the label that says, hey, a direction matters. Okay, so it's not saying it's going this way. That's just the way, like if you look at it in textbooks, hey, R is a vector. Okay. So um, this is the radius vector. This is the force vector. I want the component of this that is perpendicular to that. That would be this distance here. This would be your R perpendicular. The component of the radius that is perpendicular to the force. If you multiply those two, you're going to get the torque. Okay. Good with that. And which way would be the, the torque? What would be the direction of the torque? Into the page, out of the page. This force is going to make this square rotate which way about this pivot point? Out of the page. That makes sense? I'm not saying it's actually moving that way. I'm just saying if this was the only force acting on it, it'd make it rotate. It'd spin uh, counterclockwise. But we say out of the page is more universal, depending on which way you're looking at. It doesn't matter. Okay, good with that. Okay, so if I was looking at this force, that would be my line of action. I would slide this until it's as close to the pivot point as possible, which would be here. So I'd take this distance, that would be my R perpendicular. A lot of times this is known as the lever arm. I haven't seen it in AP, but that's a thing. Times that would give you the torque about this pivot point from that force. You okay with that? Um, this force... Here's my line of action. Is this force exerting torque? There we go with no. There's no lever arm. It goes through the pivot point. It'd be like me trying to uh, open a door or close a door by pushing this one. Come on, shut! I'm not causing it to rotate. Sorry for those people over there who can't see it. Does that make sense? Like there's no, there needs to be a component that's perpendicular. And this would be no torque as well. Good? Okay. Here, a circle kind of screams, hey, use this arrangement because the radius is all the same. So here, that's my my radius vector 
and this is my force here that's perpendicular I don't have to do anything with that okay just straight up okay same thing here here's my radius vector okay this that's my radius vector but I see that it's not perpendicular okay so what do I need to do in this case I need to tilt my axis so that one of the axes is along the radial path okay and um, so I need to find the component of force that is perpendicular to this radius so if you would if, if this isn't catching with you It would be like find the component that's perpendicular to the x axis. Okay, so I'm gonna need to find this component here. That's my f perpendicular. Does that make sense? So trig wise, I'd be in this case, I'd be using cosine. Okay, this angle here, this would be my force perpendicular. So you can do either this or this, do not do both. Find the, comp the perpendicular component of one of those and multiply by the whole vector of the other one. Good? So here's your pivot point. Comes up when you have a guess. Everybody good with A. Okay. That's the greatest radius. And it's perpendicular. Good to go. Correct answer is D, dangerous dinosaurs, just F4, makes it rotate this way. This is not making it rotate anything. These want to make it rotate clockwise. Look at that. Everybody good with B into the page. Okay, you got two of these. This is obviously bigger than that. Actually, that's bigger than that. It's more torque because it's more perpendicular. Okay, good. Thumbs up when you're good. OK. 
Okay. For the sake of time, I would recommend doing this. Um, our perpendicular component of force. So you want one of your axis doing this, one of your axis doing that. I want the component that's perpendicular, component of force that's perpendicular. Good with that. Okay. So I'm going to use cosine. Okay. Here's the catch. Um, a lot of times in textbooks, you're going to see this. Um, they'll say R, F, sine theta. I hate this equation for this reason right here. Okay. They're not wrong, but the, 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 the detail is the angle has to be between the, the radius and the force vector for this to be right. But if they throw a curveball at you and like, Hey, here's theta. Okay, I'm just going to stick it in here. Aren't wrong. So use your brain. Don't just memorize equations. Good with that. Thumbs up when you're good. I'll use this to show you both ways to do it. Either way is totally fine. My personal opinion would be to do um, the perpendicular component of the radius times the force. So line of action, bringing that force to here. That's the whole force. And so your perpendicular component would be this much. That's perpendicular. This angle is that angle. Find that you're going to use sine. Okay. That's one way to do it. The second way to do it would be to say the perpendicular component of the force times the radius. So here's my radius vector. I'm going to, that's my one axis. Okay, I know that this is, here's theta, here's theta. So I need to find the component that's perpendicular to this, this guy. So that's, this is F perpendicular to find that. Be using sine. Either way is fine. Don't do both, pick one or the other. Okay. Hey, here's a quick little thing before you start going down on this problem. If you ever see 37 degrees or 53 degrees, I want you to memorize just like you've gotten a uh, 3, 4, 5 triangle, sorry, uh, 30, 60, 90 triangle down pat, a 3, 4, 5 triangle has angles of 37, 53, and 90. So if you see 53 degrees or 37 degrees in a multiple choice, recognize they're being nice to you, and it's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. Okay? Just like if you got a 30 degrees, you know they're being nice to you, they give you a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Does that make sense?
thumbs up when you're good to go. Have a conversation and tell them how you got there. Correct answer is? Correct answer is? E, educated elephants. Okay, I do. All right. This would be my preference. I mean, you don't have to do it this way, but I, when I, I like this way better, like this, the perpendicular uh, component of the radius times force. I, that's just, if I can do that, that's just more fun for me. I don't know why. So here's my line of axis. I'm going to slide this down to here. Five, I'm still at 500 Newtons. And this distance here would be my perpendicular component. And this is one, so like 10, three, four, five triangle. This is 0 0.8. 0 0.8 times 500, 400 uh, meter newtons. Um, so you can do this as well. If you wanted to, here's your radius vector. You want, here's your axis. This 37 degrees is this 37 degrees. You want the component that's perpendicular to that. Um, so this is 500. This has to be 400. This is 300, 3, 4, 5 triangle times 1 meter, 400 meter newtons. Either way. Good? How are we feeling about torque? Okay, so using that, um, so we have net force is equal to mass times acceleration. We also have um, net torque is equal to moment of inertia, rotational acceleration, sorry, Moment of inertia times rotational acceleration. Okay. Conceptually, this is easier mathematically, but this is better conceptually. This tells us that there's a battle between force and inertia. Force wants to change things up, do something different. Mass, like, dude, inertia. I just want to, like, maintain what I'm doing. I don't want to change motion. So you see the conflict of interest, okay? And so this battle is between changing something up and keeping it not changing is acceleration, the rate at which your motion is changing, okay? You have the same battle. Torque wants to change rotational motion up. Moment of inertia, rotational inertia, wants to keep things steady state and the ratio of those two gives you how quickly your rotational motion is changing. Go to that.
Thumbs up when you have a guess. Not influenced or be influenced. Writing things down might be helpful. Have a conversation. Tell them what you think and how you think it. Why you think it. Correct answer is Correct answer is I heard C's and D's. Okay, here we go. So you want the component that's perpendicular? I would do. Oops. I would do. This equation. Um. Blah. Whatever. Okay. So I've got 0.5 cosine of 60 is 0.5. Right. That's in there. Right. Better get there. 30, 60, 90s. Okay, so you got 0.5 newtons times your radius of 0.5. Okay, so 0.25. That's the only thing exerting torque. So you got 0.25 whoop, is equal to m, which is 1, r squared, which is 0.5 squared, 0.25 alpha. 0.25 divided by 0.25 is C. Good? Thumbs up when you have a guess. Converse and defend yourself. Yeah. 
Correct answer is Correct answer is B Beautiful butterflies Okay Here's what I wanted Here's what I was going for I wanted you to recognize the difference between um, your R for torque and your R for moment of inertia. This is where the force is acting. This is where the mass is distributed. You're okay with that? This is 0. 0.5. This is 1. Good with that? So when you see R, make sure you know which one you're talking about. Sorry, so we said 0.5, right? Okay. Thumbs up when you have a guess. Correct answer is B. Point five. Okay. We have the same moment of inertia on both of those. Doubling the radius, therefore I need to have the force. Good. For the sake of time,
Okay, so because the radius are the same, so you have a force uh, over MR equals rotational acceleration. Okay, so we're from, from here to there, we're going to be doubling our radius. So in order to keep the acceleration the same, what do we need to do to the force? We need to double it. Get to that. So yes, we increased the torque, but the moment of inertia quadrupled. That makes sense. I'm going to walk you through this one. Okay. Here's how this works. Or like, here's how you go about doing this. So we're given the translational kinetic energy of the ball. So we know this is equal to one half mass times speed squared. Okay. The connection between the motion of the ball and the motion of the drum Just like the, the bicycle chain, the speed that this has is the same the speed that the rotation, not the rotational, just the translational speed at the rim. You right with that? Okay. So to figure this out, that's rotational speed times the radius. Okay, so the speed is equal to, oh, it's an R. The rotational speed is equal to the speed divided by the radius. Okay, so when we go for rotational speed, this is one half I omega squared. Okay. Um, and this is one half M R squared over V over I'm oh, sorry, I'll, I'll switch that to capital R squared because of the squared here. Okay, <clears throat> so this is equal to um, V squared over R squared. The R squareds cancel out, leaving uh, one half. One half. I mean, you could multiply that by if you get one fourth, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pull out this expression out of this because this is K. 
Does that make sense? So the rotational kinetic energy would be equal to half of the kinetic energy of the ball. Okay, this is not an always thing. Do not memorize this because I could change the moment of inertia of that drum. But do you see the technique? Okay, figure out an expression for what you know. Figure out how these two motions relate to each other. And then draw, like expand this out and see if you, you rearrange it until you can figure out how where this is hidden in this. And then pull that out and whatever's left over, that's that's your coefficient you're multiplying them by. Good to that. Okay. You got a packet due tomorrow. So we're still skipping that problem. Still skipping that problem. No, I did not. Then we can start with it together.